Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is James Green. I'm the director of the Brazil Initiative at Brown University and, the, uh, and a member of the Department of History and Portuguese Brazilian Studies. And we're really excited today to have a distinguished international journalist at Brown and writer at Brown University, Larry Roeder, to speak about um, Brazil. I'm going to give you an encapsulated biography. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to make some mistakes. You'll correct me. But uh, Larry uh, studied at Georgetown University. He also was uh, at Columbia University, where he was a specialist in East Asian studies. He worked uh, as a journalist in New York and was invited to go to Brazil, where he worked with Newsweek. Correct? Newsday? Newsweek. Newsweek, yeah. Uh, and then came back to be uh, the New York Times correspondent from 1998 to 2008. And was really, you know, his, he must have written thousands of articles about Brazil over that 10 year period. Um, I think anyone who followed Brazil in that time period know Larry Roeder's byline because he was really vi very visible and, and writing uh, very sophisticated and complex analyses of, of Brazil over this time period. Um, and we're, we're very happy that he's here today. He came to visit a friend and, and we kind of said, well, let's put together an event. This is why we, our luxurious buffet is not out because it takes two weeks to order the buffet and so we're having sandwiches today. I'm sorry that we weren't able to have the buffet. I want to thank Ramon Stern for doing the work behind this, organizing us, and Steve Kinsner for, for giving us the contacts to, uh, to, invite, to invite Larry. Um, and he will be talking today about um, two figures, uh, a man named Rondon, he'll explain who that was, and a man named Bolsonaro, and the fact that what they have in common is that uh, they both uh, were in the military, and how one from the beginning of the 20th century and another in the beginning of the 21st century. And I'll let Larry weave the story together between uh, these two characters in his presentation. So thank you very much, Larry. Let's give him a round of applause. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, and it, it's also an opportunity for me to kind of work out um, off the top of my head, in a, in a way, trying to figure out what's going to happen with Bolsonaro, what he means, and to look at him in the context of what has um, come before. And the topic that I'm addressing here is, uh, you know, the Brazilian military in a historical perspective. And I think that's uh, quite topical at the moment because, of course, on October 28th, Brazilian voters elected a former military man as their next president. Um, I don't need to dwell on, uh, you know, who he is necessarily because if you're here, you obviously have been following what's, uh, what, what took place over the last few months, his rise from the obscurity of the back bench as a member of an extremely obscure party to now president-elect. But he's n this is not the first time in the history of the Brazilian Republic that a military man has been elected president. First time was uh, actually over a century ago, 1910, uh, Hermes da Fonseca, uh, the nephew of one of the founders of the Brazilian Republic in 1889. Um, but of course, he was a general and later a marshal as well. Uh, and then the second time was in 1945 at the end of World War II when Getulio Vargas was overthrown and uh, elections were held for the first time in 16 years. And uh, Eurico Gaspar Dutra was elected president. He also was a very distinguished uh, military officer. Uh, and actually, he was a protege of um, the guy that I've just finished writing uh, a biography of, Marish Candido Rondon, who I will talk about uh, in more detail. Uh, but he had been Getulio's, uh, you know, war minister uh, and had uh, quite a distinguished trajectory in the military. Now we have Jair Bolsonaro, and um, you see uh, in the press coverage already, you know, he's described as a former military officer, um, which is technically correct uh, because he was a captain. But he is a very different kind of military man 
from uh, either of the two previous presidents or from other leading military figures in Brazilian history. Uh, just the mere fact that his rank at retirement is a captain tells you that he was largely a failure in the army. Um, he was viewed as a loose cannon uh, who could not uh, submit to discipline. Um, he became a, first became a national figure by writing a column for Veja, the weekly news magazine, in which he complained about salaries for uh, members of the military. He parlayed that into uh, a hot, you know a seat in the Brazilian Congress, but his uh, military career was not only undistinguished; it was uh, absolutely. Well, how harsh do I want to be here? Be harsh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, he was essentially a failure as a military officer. And it's interesting to see um, how he, in his public speeches now, he exalts the military uh, and its uh, achievements and as an apologist for the dictatorship of 1964 to 1985. It, 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 it sounds funny coming from someone like him. It's kind of like, um, you know, you have these figures who, people who wanted to be police officers and were rejected and then become ultra supporters of the police. And, you know, Bolsonaro to me seems a bit like that. Uh, he's a guy who couldn't make it, um, who you know, reveres, uh, I think, those who did. But I want to talk a bit about, you know, th the way he is seen in the military. Um, and here's where I'll introduce Candido Rondon, to be totally correct, Candido Mariano da Silva Rondon, um, who is, I would say, the idol of the Brazilian mil military. He is the m military officer who is most esteemed by all factions within the Brazilian armed forces uh, and is also the most unusual uh, figure in the history of the Brazilian military because he was um, a pacifist. And one of his nicknames in uh, his you know, glory years um, in the 19, period 1910 to 1930, he was nicknamed in the Brazilian press, o general pacifista. Uh, that oxymoron uh, was very uh, much a part of his historical appeal. Uh, he was also born into poverty in the state of Mato Grosso on the extreme fringes of what was then the Brazilian Empire, 1865, uh, and is admired also because he is the Brazilian equivalent of a Horatio Alger figure, a guy who comes from nothing uh, and rises on the strength of his own character, his own grit, his own intelligence, his own persistence. Uh, and for those of you who speak Portuguese, um, one of the phrases I use in the introduction to the biography I've just completed of Rondon, uh, I said, ele é o homem que veio do nada e deu tudo para o Brasil. And he came from nothing and he gave everything to Brazil. And that's the way I think he's seen in the military um, by generations of officers. Uh, he's the only Brazilian to have a state named after him. Uh, you know, his, his face has been on currency, et cetera, et cetera. He, he's one of the fundamental founding fathers of the Brazilian <coughs> Republic and, in fact, uh, participated in the uh, overthrow of the Brazilian monarchy in 1889. So when I... Uh, decided that I was going to write a biography of him, I found that when I went to deal with military archives looking for records 
um, the doors were open. Everybody was fascinated and delighted by the idea that, uh, you know, a foreigner is going to finally write a, a biography of Rondon in English or in a fo any foreign language. And something very um, unexpected for me took place. I really got to know a goodly number of serving military officers, current military officers, on a personal level, one-to-one -one level. And we would talk um, about Brazilian history, past and present. And naturally, at some point, you know, we would touch on Bolsonaro. He wasn't yet the phenomenon that he, he came to be. This is 2015, 2016, but he came up in our conversations. And this notion of him as a, a, a failure in the armed forces is, is largely instilled in me from what I heard current serving officers say about him. He wants to embrace them, but the embrace from their side is a lot more, um, there's a lot more resistance, there's a lot more caution, there's a lot more doubt. And, um, you know, I think it's, a bit dangerous at, at this early juncture to talk about, uh, you know, Bolsonaro as a conventional military figure, because it seems to me that the real soldiers have a lot of doubts about him and a lot of resistance to him and are not at all enthralled about the role that he says he envisions for them. They don't, you know, if, if I'm talking about colonels in their 40s, to pick kind of an example, um, you know, they went into the academy after the fall of the dictatorship. And they have absorbed the lessons, the historical lessons of 1964 to 1985. And I don't think that as a group, they are particularly eager to be thrust into this position that Bolsonaro um, seems to want to uh, place them. Uh, in fact, it's interesting, I read this morning in Oestado de São Paulo that <coughs> Bolsonaro's uh, pick for defense minister, uh, General Azeredo da, da Silva, said, you know, textually, uh, we don't want to play a role in politics. Uh, I, I think, you know, that's an interesting statement in the current context. The events of the last <coughs> four or five years in particular, since the outbreak of the Lava Jato corruption crisis, are such that, um, as one officer said to me, ninguém quer lidar com aquele abacaxi, right? Nobody wants to deal with that mess. Uh, they don't want to inherit all these problems. You know, they don't want to be put in charge of state autarkies and have to do the cleanup. Um, just as, you know, I found talking to younger military officers that there was concern about the army being deployed as a kind of super police force to be sent into the favelas to restore order. Um, you know, th the current crop of military officers, I think, are very proud of the service they've done in UN peacekeeping forces, most notably in Haiti, where they were the, the leaders. And they did do that kind of um, you know, urban police work in Port-au-Prince, in Cité Soleil, but, but that's in a foreign country. The idea that they're going to be brought home to go into, you know, Subiru Moru, go into the, 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 the favelas in Rio or in any other large Brazilian city, um, is viewed with a certain um, alarm by them for various reasons, right? Uh, among them, the power of corruption, of drug money, <coughs> the fact that they'd be uh, 
um, dealing with their own fellow citizens rather than foreigners. So this is another area where there's this kind of, hmm, this dubiousness about Bolsonaro. Uh, and finally, a a as regards the, the, the military attitudes, um, again, you notice that I'm stressing younger officers who have not yet reached the uh, generalato, you know, they don't have stars on their, their shoulders yet. Um, now, perhaps with older officers, especially those who uh, are recently retired, you're going to find different attitudes. You look at Bolsonaro's running mate, General Moron, he's from that group. Um, you look at some of the other people around him, uh, <coughs> excuse me, G General Eleno, who he's, who he's named as his national security advisor. And they may not have some of the same uh, skepticism as these younger officers do. But the younger officers, of course, are the future of the, the Brazilian military. And the point I want to make is that we should be very cautious about thinking of the army as a monolith. The army is still, of course, the most important of the three branches, more so than the Navy, more so than the Air Force. But it's, it's not a monolith. There are divisions of opinion. There are people who are enthusiastic about Bolsonaro. There are people uh, who are extremely skeptical. And it seems to me that maybe <coughs> I can detect a certain historical echo here. Because if you look at Brazilian history, a hundred years ago, uh, you know, as, as Brazil was going into the 1920s, and you saw that the republic that had been declared in 1889, well, 30 years later, it's pretty corrupt. It's terribly corrupt. You have this arrangement where the presidency alternates between the states of Sao Paulo and the states of Minas Gerais, and everything is built on, uh, you know, uh, machine politics and uh, absolute, you know, corruption uh, in a style. I'm from Chicago, and um, I recognize the similarities between the way patronage is used to buy votes and uh, jobs are shared. Uh, on the basis of your loyalty to those in power. And of course, the reaction to that was in the 1920s, the movement known in Portuguese as Tenentismo. Young officers with grave doubts uh, <coughs> about the um, political system to which, of which they were a part and which they were supposed to swear their loyalty. And you had uh, a series of rebellions in that period that led, of course, in 1930 to the overthrow of the public, of the First Republic, and uh, the installation of Getulio Vargas in power uh, from 1930 to 1945, a dictatorship. Now, I, I don't want to go so far as to say that we should expect this kind of uh, political effervescence in the forms of revolts and uprisings within the military. That's, that, that would be going way, way, way too far. But you can see uh, in the military that there is both uh, today uh, in the military, there is both an awareness that the system that went into place in 1985 is um, not, not necessarily failed yet, but it's, it's wobbly, and that there have been lots of abuses, and that we uh, need to think about Brazil's future, but at the same time, a reluctance to take on the role that Bolsonaro seems to want to thrust upon the military. 
so let me place this uh, again I I a bit in um, the context of Rondon, <coughs> um, in whose life I've been immersed for the last three and a half years. Uh, initially, I was drawn to write about him because he is, um, without a doubt, the greatest explorer ever of the tropics. Uh, he opened up vast areas of the Brazilian north and northwest, the Amazon and the areas just south of it, uh, to incorporation into the Brazilian state. And uh, he, you know, from 1890 to 1930, he led a couple of dozen expeditions uh, that, in which he traversed 40,000 kilometers on foot or horseback or in canoes in these unexplored areas of Brazil. Of course, the most famous here in the English-speaking world, the most famous of these expeditions is the one that he did with Theodore Roosevelt in 1913 and 1914. But that was only one of numerous uh, expeditions and not even the most perilous of the expeditions that Rondon undertook. But beyond that, um, that's what initially drew me in, but beyond that, I discovered that he was an extremely sophisticated um, political figure, a statesman in the best sense of that word. He had certain interests that uh, were fundamental to him that he always took into consideration, most, um, you know, most particularly the status of Brazil's indigenous peoples. He was himself uh, largely of indigenous descent. His mother was uh, from the Bororo and Terena peoples. His father was a mixture of African, um, uh, Guana, Indian, and Spanish and Portuguese blood. And Rondon um, ended up speaking, in addition to Portuguese and Spanish and French and German, uh, eight different Indian languages, wrote the first grammars, the first uh, ethnological studies of perhaps a dozen different Brazilian tribes. Uh, so he, he is the, the great indigenous uh, rights crusader in Brazil. And when he died in 1958, at the age of 93, I found the obituary that um, was published by the Red Cross in Geneva for him. And you have to remember now that 1958, Martin Luther King was not yet a national figure here in the United States or international figure. And it describes, this obituary of Rondon describes him as the second greatest pacifist of the 20th century only to Gandhi. Exceeded, only exceeded by Gandhi. So this is how remarkable a figure he was, a, a, um, a, a general who didn't want to shoot anybody, um, whose motto as the uh, indigenous rights crusader was uh, die if necessary but kill never, and who as a result was nominated three times for the Nobel Peace Prize. The first time was by Albert Einstein, who came to Brazil in 1924 and um, saw the films that Rondon had made in the Amazon for ethnographic purposes and saw Rondon's p peaceful methods uh, in operation and was so um, amazed by what he saw that he nominated Rondon to the Nobel Peace Prize Committee in uh, Oslo. Of course, Rondon did not win. Um, in those days, I don't think that uh, five foot three Indian generals from Latin America uh, had a chance to win uh, a Nobel Prize. But it gives you some sense of the um, dimensions of the man, uh, which, you know, as I got deeper and deeper into his life, um, became to me as important uh, or as meaningful as uh, the explorations. He was the head of the first League of Nations peacekeeping team, for example, uh, which was dispatched to the 
border between Colombia and Peru after those two countries went to war with each other in the late 1920s. Um, he, as an old, old man, let's see, 1940, he's already, uh, he's already almost 80. He's in his late 70s. He becomes one of the founders of something called the, so the, the Society of Friends of the Americas, which exists to keep Brazil from going into World War II on the side of the Axis powers, um, because Getulio Vargas was, as I look at him, uh, a, a proto-fascist figure. Uh, I know that that's, uh, in, among many Brazilians, that's a, uh, a, a controversial assessment. Um, he, he did a lot of things for the poor, but his, he was an autocrat. And he was sympathetic to the Nazis. He was sympathetic to Mussolini's fascism. And Rondon um, was absolutely appalled at the idea that that was taking place. Um, Getulio had expelled him from the army in 1930 for lack of loyalty. And um, Rondon did not want to see his beloved country going into World War II on the side of the Axis powers. He did want to see Brazil going into World War II uh, on the side of the Allies. He was very much a Francophile. Um, and um, when France fell, it was transformational for him. And so he was one of the founders of this group, which was eventually shut down by the di dictatorship of Getulio Vargas. But it, it was very effective in lobbying um, for both um, Brazilian participation in World War II and raising funds to send to Europe to back the Allies. The idea that rich Brazilians would donate their pearls and their uh, you know, gold bracelets um, and jewelry to be, and then sold so that the Allies um, and the refugees would have support. What got this organization shut down by Getulio in the end was that it also began to lobby for democracy within Brazil. The argument was, how can we be supporting democracy abroad when we don't have it here at home? We must have it here at home, too. So he did this as a, you know, a, 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 a man in his late 70s. Uh, and he continued to be active in Brazilian life, political life, until his final months. His last interview was on his birthday in 1956. Uh, and he made some very interesting remarks then uh, about the army and its role in Brazilian life that I think are still relevant today. Um, Juscelino Kubitschek was president of Brazil. He had been elected, but there was an attempt at a coup, and then there was a counter coup to guarantee that he took power. Rondon very much supported Kubitschek. And uh, Kubitschek came to visit him to get his support for the uh, building of Brasilia. Um, this is in an area that Rondon had explored in the 1890s, and therefore there was a lovely symbolism about the old general uh, throwing his support to Kubitschek's project to build the new capital. But in this last interview, after seeing Kubitschek, Rondon said, I'm going to say this in Portuguese first because it's short but very eloquent. He said, O exército deve ser o grande mudo. The army should remain mute. So this is something that he, all through his career had adhered to, and in his very last public pronouncement, he's consistent with what he always had believed during the course of the Brazilian Republic. In the 1920s, the, the young ten lieutenants movement had come to him and said, we're planning a coup. We're going to oust President Bernardes and install a military regime. We want you to be our leader and to become president. Twice. He turned down that offer. 
because he thought it was inappropriate for the military to play this leading political role. Um, he also turned down offers to be governor of his native state of Mato Grosso, cabinet minister, senator, congressional deputy. He did not believe that it was proper for uh, military officers to play political roles, overt political roles of any sort. He said his, his, his theme was to serve the country always, but to be involved in politics, never. And he died in 1958, and of course, in six years later, um, we, have the we have the coup that leads to the dictatorship. He clearly would have disapproved uh, had he still been alive. And it's interesting to see um, how his protégés did or did not follow his guidance. Uh, some of them did and were not involved in the, the coup of March 31st, 1964. Others, however, were deeply involved. Um, so it's, it's a mixed record as regards um, how his teachings were absorbed and adhered to by uh, fellow officers. But he's there as an example. And all through the dictatorship, for example, for example the, the current um, commander of the army, General Vilas Boas, he uh, went into the uh, academy in 1967. And in Brazil, there's a tradition, every class picks someone to idol as, as their like symbolic sponsor. And he is from the Rondon class. His people, his fellow, uh, you know, students from that year, they all admired Rondon so much that they took him as th their, their inspiration. And, um, you know, I, I've looked at Brazilian military movies, training movies, uh, from the dictatorship, and they exalt Rondon as, uh, you know, a pinnacle of Brasilidade, of Brazilianness. Um, as someone who served the country unselflessly. But at the same time, when you go back to look at his funeral, his funeral um, eulogy was delivered by Darcy Ribeiro, who was his, uh, his last young um, disciple, an anthropologist. Of course, a lot of you know who Darcy Ribeiro is, but I'll explain. Um, he you know, was an anthropologist who became a politician. He was Minister of Education, Senator from Rio. And at the time the coup uh, took place in 1964, he was the chief of staff for Jean Goulart, the president who was thrown out. And Darcy Ribeiro was jailed uh, and eventually forced into exile. But in his memoirs, he tells of being held at this um, prison, military prison in Rio, and how the uh, hardcore officers there couldn't believe that this communist, as, which is how they thought of him, uh, could ever have anything to do with our beloved Rondon. And he had to uh, have them dig out his funeral eulogy from 1956 before they would believe it. So you see here how um, the, use, the various uses of Rondon after his death by both tendencies in Brazilian politics. The humanist tendency personified by Darcy Ribeiro and then his, all of his intellectual progeny, and the nationalistic um, manipulation of Rondon's image uh, by the, you know, the, the, the Golbery, Couto e Silva group within the military, the, the very strongly uh, national security state uh, elements. So Rondon is this central figure, um, but people make of him what they will. They, they pick and choose elements that, um, uh, you know, combine with their own outlook on history and, um, you know, the, the history of Brazil, uh, especially as a, a republic. And I would expect that Bolsonaro is going to do the same. Um, you know, I haven't heard him mention Rondon yet, but uh, some of the things that I expect him to do will be an absolute contravention 
of everything that Rondon stood for. And it's going to be interesting to see how he takes um, Rondon's teachings, his declarations, his attitudes, and tries to use them for his own purposes. Specifically, um, as, as I said to Jim earlier, uh, you know, Bolsonaro is an equal opportunity <laughs> hater, but um, I'm especially concerned about indigenous matters, uh, given that Bolsonaro has said he doesn't think that the, the Indians should be allowed to have reser reservations, um, that all they need to be integrated as quick as possible into the overall Brazilian population. These are all ideas antithetical to everything that Rondon believed uh, and stood for. The idea, his idea was that the, that the Indians were the original inhabitants of Brazil. Um, initially, he, he wanted them to be treated as separate nations within Brazilian territory. Uh, he also believed that they should be allowed to choose the velocity at which they wanted to affiliate themselves with Brazilian society, and if they didn't want to have any association with Brazilian society at all, that was also okay. It was still the duty of the Indian Protection Service, which Rondon founded, uh, um, to, protect, to, to look out for them and give them the autonomy that they wished. Um, so this is, this is, in the whole panoply of things we're going to be watching uh, Bolsonaro do and say, this is the one that comes closest to uh, the trajectory of Rondon's <coughs> career and his deepest, most fundamental interest. There are others, of course, but um, this is the one that I think hits closest to home for him. Uh, I guess I should, yeah, I, I've been going for... Uh, but, um, but that's a, the general outlines, I, you know, I, I, because I see that Rondon and Bolsonaro as, as polar opposites, as, as representing two very different visions of Brazil and of what the army is and should be. Uh, and I'll be happy to um, elaborate, uh, you know, taking questions for as long as, uh, you know, you want to fire them at me. Yeah. Just yeah. Ask sure. Back there. So can you elaborate a bit more about kind of like humanist tendencies in the military today? Because I think it's just very interesting how a lot of the younger, um, like I feel like in a lot of places that transition to mil from military dictatorships to democracies, the army kind of tends to be more like more of an apologist for the old dictatorship, or it seems like what you're saying is among young military men, like. There's a there's kind of a recognition that like no this was bad we want to yeah it didn't work yeah I mean I don't know that they would make a moral judgment that it was bad okay. but they would say it just didn't work out and we don't want to be sucked into this again um, yeah you know the the humanist tradition I, I think is embraced more by the Brazilian left uh, as the part of Rondon they like the most the military still loves um, Rondon's self sacrifice. Uh, his physical courage, his absolute persistence, his bravery uh, as um, qualities that the ideal officer uh, would um, embody, but you know also this this notion that I, when I, that, that statement I made about the the army should be remain mute o grande mudo I was directed to that statement by um, uh, an army colonel. Um, I wasn't aware of it. And he said to me, you want to go look at this? And, you know, here's what he said. Stay out of politics. Um, and, 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 you know, that's, that's not necessarily humanist, but it's um, a non-interventionist view of what the Army's role is. National development, um, protection, but not getting into the swamp of partisan politics. Yes? But you also spoke of this being kind of a mid-ranking officers in yes. their mid-40s, right? So, yeah. I mean, to the extent that you know how, you know, who, ha who has weight when it comes to making decisions in the military and how might that play out? 
on yeah. Bolsonaro because you know uh, the vast body of young officers might be sympathetic with him and maybe the older generals are too and so you know, how important is this middle? <coughs> yeah, I mean clearly the military is the ultimate hierarchical organization. Uh, so the generals um, are have the final say on everything. But I think even among some of them, the smart ones who have uh, gone to the war college, either in Brazil or abroad, and seen um, how things have worked out in other countries, I don't think they uh, are particularly eager to get sucked into this situation either. It's taken all these years for the military, I mean the military, in 1985, the military left power completely discredited, utterly discredited. It's taken all this time to win back a certain um, respect or at least a lack of hostility among the populace at large. And uh, there's an awareness that you put that at risk if you go whole hog behind Bolsonaro. I mean, part of it is that Bolsonaro himself may not even know what he wants. He is very much a Trump-like figure. Um, he says what he's thinking at that moment, what serves him. Um, and if you tie yourself too closely to someone like that, um, it, ha it can damage the institution to which you, you belong. So I'm making a, a, a twofold distinction here. I think that among younger uh, officers, uh, below below general, um, that there's a kind of a philosophical uh, um, worry and objection to what Bolsonaro could represent. Whereas at the level of the command, I think it's much more pragmatic. It's not just that it's, you know, that it's wrong, um, but this is going to screw things up for us. This is going to you know, um, uh, stain our image once again uh, because we have no way of knowing what this guy wants to do, but what he says is alarming. That conflicts with the, the principle of hierarchy that you, you carry out orders from your, um, your superior, and the president is the superior, and he was elected with 55% of the vote. But I think it's going to be one of the, that. This is one of the questions that's going to make the next four years, if it, if he lasts four years, um, so uh, turbulent, uh, so decisive, so important, um, and so uncertain. That's a long answer, but I, that I, I hope I answered. Okay. Um, first of all, that was such a beautifully crisp and clear presentation. I, I really. <laughs> history and to kind of tell very complex things in a very concise way. Thanks. The audience of following it is really good. I'm really it's very nice. I'm just looking forward to your coming back to Brown on other occasions. Be happy um, to. I have two questions. The first is um, based on your experience as a, as a journalist. Um, it it's became very evident between the first and the second round when it looked like Bolsonaro was going to win that the media, uh, you know, Morning Joe. Uh, MSNBC immediately associated him as the Trump of the tropics, the Trump of the South, as a right-wing horrible figure. And in a lot of ways it did those of us who were organizing the resistance or the opposition to him to be having a head, head up, a head start, because we didn't have to say who this person was. They had a general knowledge of that. Right. So it's, a short, it's a shorthand quote. Right. So the question has to do with the branding around that. Um, yeah. And I guess what I, I don't know if I have a question, you can certainly comment on that, but I, I think I wanted to actually make an appeal to you that you are a profound person, with a profound knowledge of Brazil as an outsider. And I hope that you find vehicles, and maybe we can offer you a vehicle here, to continue to be writing uh, thoughtfully and insightfully about the situation in Brazil as we're trying to help American people understand yeah. the complexities yeah. of the country. Because I think you have. Uh, really important insights. I've learned a lot from you just from this, this brief. Uh, so that's a kind of appeal to you to think about that in terms of <coughs> what your plans are for your future, which I don't, think, I don't know what they are. But I wanted to ask you the question of, what do you think of the uh, decision to appoint Moro to be the Ministry of Justice? Man, I was 
I mean, I, I've been um, a supporter of Lava Jato, and um, I, you know, I think it's uh, been a, it's been a very painful process for the country, and I see my friends and relatives agonizing over it. Um, and one of the comf one of the ways that you can argue against people who were saying, "Oh, it's just an anti-PT uh, movement," was to say, "Well, look at ISU Nevis. They're they're looking at him too. Look at Michel Temer. They're looking at him too." And for Moru to take on the justice job, I just think it's a mistake. It's a mistake, maybe not for him. I don't know what his personal goals and ambitions are. Um, but, you know, immediately you see Lula filing an appeal on the grounds that, it, that Moro taking the job as justice minister shows that the whole thing was just a partisan witch hunt. <laughs> Where have we heard that phrase before? Um, so I, I think it was a mistake. I was disappointed that he d that he did it. I wished he hadn't done it. Um, I hope it doesn't. I, I don't. I, I I find myself asking myself, how is he going to survive in that environment? How is he? Who I I view him as a man of integrity. How is he going to be able to operate in that environment without sacrificing? Um, his own integrity, because when I look at the people around Bolsonaro, you know, some of them are just as corrupt, in my view, as um, the people who have gone to jail in Lava Jato. Um, yeah, so the short answer is it's a mistake. Oh. Steve. Thanks for that uh, very interesting exposition, Larry. I want to. Uh, since once you leave, we won't have anyone else to ask about uh, Rondon. Uh, and we'll all continue talking about Bolsonaro. Let me take you back and ask you a couple of questions about him, because he seems like such a fascinating figure. First of all, did Rondon represent, how was he seen among Brazilians at the time? Would he represent a trend of people that believe this kind of thing? Or was he founding a new idea? What Was there a great resistance against him? And secondly, uh, being one of those narrow-minded Americans that you mentioned earlier, I uh, was only interested in one little piece. Can you tell us a little bit about his uh, experience with Teddy Roosevelt in the jungle? Uh, I know you wrote about it, but we haven't heard much about it yeah. here. Um, well, Rondon was a much admired figure in his heyday um, because the idea that somebody's going into that jungle and braving those elements um, and that he's pacifying is the word they use, these Indian tribes in a nonviolent fashion. Wow, what a guy. But also he was viewed as an eccentric. And he was, um, being an indigenous person himself, he was the object of racial prejudice. And he had to contend with that. Um, so he's a very much a sui generis figure, I think, in, in Brazilian history. And I found during the um, Estado Novo, the dictatorship of, of Getulio Vargas, a very interesting phenomenon going on, which was that he was in personal disgrace. He had been booted out of the army in 1930 because he didn't support the, the coup that ended the First Republic. Yet his figure was so inspiring to Brazilians that they took it, the, 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 what was called the DIP, Departamento de Imprensa e Propaganda, of the dictatorship. They took his person, his image, and used it to inspire Brazilians to move away from the coast into the interior. And he was held up as this ideal of the, tra the three races being combined in one person, the European, the indigenous, and the Afro-Brazilian, all in one man. So, uh, you know, I saw these newsreels from the period of the dictatorship, and my mother-in-law remembers seeing them as a child in the theaters, um, in which Rondon is per portrayed as, as this heroic, you know, no other person but a Brazilian could do what, what he's done. He's the shining example of our national, you know, our, our national uh, ethos. So that's the first question. Roosevelt. Um, you know, I really hit the jackpot on the Roosevelt stuff because 
uh, the Brazilian military was willing to let me rummage through the archives and I found Rondon's diaries and I found all kinds of stuff, me medical, the, the medical reports that the doctor on the expedition filed on Teddy Roosevelt complaining that Teddy and Kermit refused to take their quinine and thus were coming down with malaria. Um, stuff, stuff like that. But Rondon and Roosevelt uh, admired each other greatly, um, as you would expect, having survived that ordeal together. But during the expedition itself, there were some really severe clashes um, over specific issues of how you should explore, because Rondon's attitude was, well, this is what I do. We're descending this river, the River of Doubt, and while we're going to name it for you, Theodore, um, I want to map it precisely, every bend and twist and turn. Roosevelt wanted to get it done quickly because he wanted to get home. He was worried about Wilson getting the U.S. into war with Mexico. He felt isolated on the sidelines. I'm in the middle of the jungle. I can't throw my voice in. Um, he wanted to get it done. Let's not stop every hundred yards to do the, you know, the, 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 the sightings. Um, and then there was a key moment where one member of the expedition killed another and fled into the jungle. And the question was, um, what do we do about this guy? And uh, Roosevelt, oh, I'm giving this away. I mean, this is in the book. Uh, yeah. Um, but Rondon, uh, Roosevelt's attitude was, we hunt him down and we execute him on the spot. We all know, all of us here know, there, are, there were 23 of us, now there's 21, one's dead and one is fled into the jungle. We all know who did this. We heard the gunshot. We, we capture him and we execute him on the spot because we are running out of food. We're all sick. He's going to be a drag on the expedition if we take him down the river all the way to Manaus. He has to be eliminated. Rondon said, absolutely not, my dear Colonel. Uh, we do not have the death penalty in Brazil. We're going to follow the law and we are going to uh, take him to Manaus for trial. And they really clashed over this. Uh, it, in, in the end, be, it became a moot point because they never were able to, uh, you know, capture him. But, um, but that's the sort of thing where there were important cultural differences between the two expedition leaders. Yes? I saw it like two years ago, uh, the expedition in the jungle. Then the second question I asked, uh, what would have transpired if Roosevelt would have died? Well, great question. Well, uh, to, to the first part, um, I know what the documentary you're talking about um, because I was one of the talking heads in that, and um, I didn't want to. You know, I didn't want to do the reveal on somebody's documentary when I was writing a book. That's that's the that's the short and and honest answer. Um, and the second part was. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, he did. He he and he wanted to commit suicide actually, um, and and Rondon talked him out of it. Rondon said, "My dear Colonel," uh, and and they spoke in French because Roosevelt didn't speak. Portuguese and Rondon didn't speak English, so French was the common language they had. But it was mon cher colonel, uh, you know, and, and he said, this expedition is named the Roosevelt Rondon expedition, and clearly it cannot go on without you. But, you know, he was under instruction, Rondon was under instructions, do not let him die, <laughs> because the what the, what the Brazilians wanted, what Rio de Janeiro, the Brazilian government wanted, was for Roosevelt to write a book, which he did, raving about the potential uh, riches of the Amazon and envisioning a world in which all these people would come and settle and there'd be ranches and farms. Um, and, and in fact, you know, Roosevelt did write that book. It's called Through the Brazilian Wilderness. And if he died, it would be the worst kind of PR that the, that the Brazilian government could you know, ever, ever have. So Rondon was said, you know, was, was told specifically, whatever you do, don't let him die. It was that explicit.
So, yes. Yeah, I, I'm, I'd like to get back to what is our current preoccupation yeah. here with regard to the military. And I, I feel like Michael Corleone. <laughs> I, I want to get away from it, but no matter what I do, I get dragged back <laughs> in. <laughs> to your destiny. Um, and I, I realize it's a question you can't answer, but I'd be curious as to your speculations anyway. And that is, so far we've got, uh, on the one hand, the sort of colonels in their 40s who you see as quite resistant to letting the military get dragged into a political role. And then we have the recently retired generals who may be sort of Sebastianists for the for yeah. for the and, uh, and they're, they're they're like a generation older, right? Exactly. Yeah. And but as you pointed out, the real question is who's going to decide what happens in the military will be some segment of the current generals, uh, and one imagines maybe they're maybe they have a unified position. One doubts it. And so I'm just curious whether you have any speculation as to what the divisions are among the most power, currently yeah. powerful segments and how that might play out, depending on what happens. Yeah, I, I wish I was privy yeah, sure. to that. <laughs> uh, I'm not. But, I, but let me answer your question um, indirectly. Um, I became a correspondent in Brazil in 1977 for the American press. And um, the very first story that I did was um, an attempt, a coup attempt, by the hardline leader of the, hard, the hardline faction within the Brazilian military, a, a guy named General Silvio Frota, who was trying to under, who wanted to throw out Geisel and the whole abertura uh, process. Now, you know, I knew vaguely who Silvio Frota was and what his position was, but I didn't expect a coup, and I don't think a coup attempt, um, which was squashed. And uh, then, you know, to have this happen, it was like, well, where did this come from? Because the military was, you know, I don't want to say it was, um, you know, a completely closed world, but certainly as a foreigner, I didn't have and a recently arrived foreigner, I didn't have access to that. And then in 1978, Geisel decides that his successor is going to be Figueiredo. But what happens? There's another candidate for president from the military, General Euler Benches Monteiro. And so he represents yet another, you know, tendencia within the military, someone who wants to um, accelerate things, uh, you know, get, get rid of the dictatorship qu quicker. And so, you know, here, here I am as this novice reporter in Brazil, and you can identify at least three different lines of thought. Um, now, I still don't have access to the high command, <laughs> um, although I'm hoping that th with the book that, you know, I'll get some invitations to, to talk to you know, high-ranking military officers and talk with them about things other than Rondon. Um, but, you know, I cannot conceive of even the high command as a monolith. There have got to be differences of, I mean, because when I, when I look at Rondon's, you know, how many years was he? He was in the military for 48 years. And I really had to go into Brazilian military politics the resistance within the military to certain things that he was doing, um, arguments over uh, how he was wasting the Army's money, uh, you know, building these telegraph lines and roads and whatnot. And clearly from, you know, 1890 onward, there have always been divisions within the military hierarchy. Civilians have not always been privy to them, but they're always there. So the only thing I can say about what we're going to be facing over the next four years is, uh, you know, I'm going to avoid the trap of thinking of the military as a monolith, and I'm going to be very attentive trying to read tea leaves as to what this declaration, however veiled it may be, might mean, or this action. Um, so that, you know, yes, I'm going to speculate like everybody else, um, 
because that's you, you just have to. It, it, unless you're an army officer talking out of school, um, you know that's the the best thing you can hope for. Yes. Thank you for your speech. It was really amazing. And I'd like to ask you about the, our tr democratic transition in Brazil was some kind of a compromise. 1985. Yeah. Yeah. So it's contrasting with those around, like Argentina and Chile. Yeah. And what was the role of this uh, compromise in Brazil, letting not punishing those military there in the political struggle there that in these different segments we have now? Well, of course, I think that deal was made earlier, right? In 1979. When uh, got before before Figueiredo came in and Geisel declared the amnesty, and part of the deal was um, that th you know there's going to be no prosecution of the people can come back, including the ones who kidnapped ambassadors, uh, you know so all those folks come back, um, but at the same time there's not going to be any prosecution of the people who did the torturing, um, so th that's prior to 1985. But yeah, in 1985, I mean, you know, when I, when I think of the death of Tancredo Neves and that Sarney comes in to become president instead, you know, the vicissitudes of history are amazing. Um, you know, I think, if, and in Brazilian history, you know, if Tancredo Neves had not died and Sarney didn't become president, if Ulysses Guimarães' helicopter hadn't crashed and he died, if Mario Colvis hadn't contracted cancer and been unavailable to, and been available to be the successor candidate to Fernando Henrique, how might Brazilian history have been different? Um, so I think 1985, yes, there were compromises. Um, and Just at that time, yeah. Leonidas said the general Le Leonidas. He yeah. said, okay, Sarney is going to be the one in charge. Yeah. So, José Murilo de Carvalho says that the army is the one who guarantee order in Brazil. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. And now, just now, General Villas Boas yeah. said that uh, we are, or was, Brazil was in the verge of a, a chaos. And so they intervened. Because in 1964. No, no, now. No. Oh, now. Now, he yeah. tweeted something about Lula's. So do you think that we still have this role to the army to guarantee order there? As the interventor? Yeah. Man, that's the key question, isn't it? <laughs> that's, that's really the key question. Yeah. I had to intervene because inside the army there was some discontent about Lula being free. And so we have to. to yeah, you mean you mean yesterday to go to the, the court yes. when, Lula, when Lula left the prison. No, that uh, they were judging. Uh, the yeah, the latest stage of Lava Jato. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I think that if Haddad had won, and he attempted to free Lula, then you might have a real problem. Um, you know, I don't know General Vilas Boas well enough to understand what motivated him to say that. Um, but I, I, you know, it's again, it's one of those things, right? In boca fechada no entra mosca. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a really exciting roller coaster ride the next four years. So, yeah. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, I have two, two questions. Uh, the first, uh, I know that you didn't uh, research about the other forces and your connections uh, is more uh, with the army. Yeah. But if you have some, uh, some uh, opinions about the position of the other forces, Navy and uh, yeah. uh, Air Forces, uh, Air Force. And the other one is, uh, Besides all the, these divisions among uh, the, the military, the generational thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, the, the, yeah. Uh, can we uh, say that 
the opposition uh, against, for example, measures like the tr uh, National Truth Commission, there is a, 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 a homogeneous opposition against this kind of measures that we call transitional justice. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I remember when all these documents started being found at Army bases or, and Air Force bases. Uh, and, you know, it was clear there was a, a cover-up going on. Um, look at who was in power then. You, ha you know, this was a, a period when uh, either Fernando Henrique was president or then Lula, and who was the defense minister at the time, right? I mean, you have... Um, you know, and later, and, and Dilma as well, right? You have Celso Amorim, you have Habelu, a communist, as defense minister. Um, and they didn't, took, they didn't take any real actions against that sort of cover-up. Now you have a guy, well, no, no I, I mean, I, there were actions taken, but they were kind of extra official, right? They're, they're not government-sponsored, because I remember pressing the people uh, you know, in the government under all three of these, well, uh, yeah, uh, th uh, during three different terms, what about, what about, what about? And, um, you know, there was this sense that that was the third rail of Brazilian politics. You didn't, you didn't touch that. Whoops. Um, but now you've got a guy who not only, his view of the dictatorship is that it was a wonderful thing. Yeah. And that, you know, the only fault was that they didn't kill more people, that they should have been more like the Chileans and the Argentines. So, you know, it makes me um, despair to think that the historical record is going to be um, kept under wraps, that we're not going to, you know, the, I mean, when you think of what Putin has done in Russia, to cover up what happened under Stalin. Um, you know, I fear Bolsonaro being a figure of that sort in, in, in Brazil. Um, but, you know, to be perfectly frank, I, I never detected any great enthusiasm in his predecessors, even Dilma, who was tortured herself. It was like, deixa para lá. Do, yeah, turn, yeah. Yeah, virar a página. How many times have you, have, have you turned, heard what that she's, phrase? What she's told me was much more a fear that they had touched too much, the military would have reacted so strongly that it would have weakened the government significantly. Yeah. yeah that's, I mean, that's the logic, whether you agree with that or not. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, you know, when, when I was based in Rio, I covered the whole southern cone, and I went to Chile and Argentina a lot, and, you know, l let's be frank. Both of those countries have done a better job of confronting their pasts than, than Brazil has. Um, yes, you know, the, what, what took place in Brazil was not on the same scale as in those two countries. But that's an argument for being able to deal with it yeah. because it, it, it wasn't, as, it's not 30,000 people killed as in Argentina. It's not even 4,000 people, you know, as in Chile. So why can't you confront it? I don't know if that answers your question. No, absolutely, yes, yes. And about uh, the Navy and the... Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, wow. Because they have a lot of conflicts. Yeah, they do, inter-service yeah, inter yeah, yeah. conflicts. And I always found the Air Force to be the hardest to deal with. And, and I know from the dictatorship reading the records that they were the most hard-ass. Yeah. You know, they were the worst torturers, um, you know, to take just one example, what they did to Geraldo Vandré was absolutely horrible. Um, they, you know, and, and they, they seem to be the most reluctant to own up to what happened. Um, and, you know, whenever I was doing reporting, even on non-controversial subjects, um, you know, I always found them to be suspicious and wanting to, you know, create barriers and impediments. Uh, I know, you know, I, I once got um, a very nasty letter from a 
um, Air Force um, officer who was in charge of, you know, public relations because I had talked about the Air Force originating with surplus aircraft donated to Brazil by the Americans. The, the stuff that went to the bases up there in the Northeast to go over to Africa during World War II. And, you know, that, that conflicted with the story that they tell among themselves. And, you know, he didn't like it. So the, the Air Force is tough to deal with. I, and, you know, I can't say anything about them. And the Navy, you know, I think the Navy is more pragmatic. I, 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 you know, the Navy, I think, is so focused on the nuclear thing still. So if Bolsonaro says, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll resume. I mean, now you have the astronaut as the Minister of Science and Technology, right? Marcelo Ponches. Uh, and if he says, yeah, okay, great, let's go for, you know, you can resume your nuclear research. The Navy will be perfectly happy. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so yes. Thank, oh, one, more, one, more, one last question. Yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation. And I, as an outsider, I'm interested in history and where we are in America. Yeah. All the Latin American countries. Um, it was my understanding in 2011 that Brazil was booming with an economy and technology all of when did that change? When did that change? Yes. Well, I mean, let's see. 2010 was the year the economy grew, what, 7.2 percent, something like that? Um, and then it went kind of downhill from there. But, uh, you know, to me, 2014 is really a turning point in, in, in it's kind of the year that everything fell apart. Uh, well, for one thing, the massive corruption came to light, um, and and you know we're talking we're talking corruption on a scale that's almost unimaginable. Um, you know, gosh, just from the oil, the state oil company, we're talking I, I don't know how many billions of dollars. There's a wonderful, um, you know, that show John Oliver the, last week tonight or whatever it's called. On, on cable television. He did a wonderful sk sketch in about 2015 on the Brazil tanking. Um, and that's still, it's a very funny one, um, but you know, he, he focuses in on, on um, car wash, the, the, the corruption scandal. And, and to me, you know, that's a turning point not only in terms of the economy, but in terms of the psychology of the Brazilian people. Because one of the things I love about Brazil is the eternal optimism. You know, tudo vai dar certo, everything's going to turn out all right. Um, and, you know, since 2014, I mean, I see the country, the people becoming more and more sour and bitter and angry um, about everything. And the and you know the the uh, the idea that everything is going to end up with imp, you know impunity with a, another massive cover up, and you know there's there's countervailing um, information to go against that. All these corrupt businessmen who are in jail and the corrupt politicians who are in jail, but you know the anger and the bitterness are so have have just been growing, and I think that's part of what. Um, results in Bolsonaro. You know, he's, he's feeding on that. And he's feeding on it and fomenting it at the same time. So, you know, it, it, it's more that, yes, Brazil was booming and that brings, it, it brings an optimism. And, you know, social inequality had been reduced over a 20 year period, uh, a, you know, a process that began under uh, Fernando Henrique and then accelerated under Lula. Um, and, and that, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that Brazilians were happy about, proud of, um, and then, you know, everything just twisted and turned. Uh, I, you know, and, and that's where we are now. I'm sorry, but I want to add back yeah. to what you were saying. So the psychology is that people are angry and very um, 
dissatisfied with what is yeah. happening. What will be, from your perspective? From, I'm sorry, from my perspective? Yes. Yeah. What will be the, the trigger point that Brazil, the, the people of Brazil, will come to the street and demand uh, democracy? Well, well, that's a that's a very profound question. I mean, there's a new there's a new book out by two Brazilian historians, um, Lilia Schwartz and Eloisa Starling. Um, it's called Brazil: A Biography, and their argument is that the struggle for democracy in Brazil is a 500-year battle, and that there are advances and retreats and advances and retreats, and you know, we've had a period of, a, we had a 20 year period, let's say, of advance, 1994 to 19, to 2014. And now we're in a period of retreat. But over the long view, which is beyond our lifespans, you know, you, you, you have to, there are things about Brazil that make one optimistic. I mean, it was the last country in the Western Hemisphere to abolish slavery. Um, it still doesn't want to come to grips with the heritage of that. Um, but there have been, you know, enormous social advances made. Um, and, you know, getting rid of the, getting rid of the, here's, here's one thing. Getting rid of the dictatorship nonviolently was an achievement. You know, Brazilians have a knack for bringing about social change without the kind of violence that we see. You know, I don't want to say it's completely nonviolent because there are, but, you know, the kind of social, um, uh, you know, breaks in the fabric that you see in countries like Argentina or Chile or Colombia or Venezuela. Um, so, you know, it's just an ongoing process, and, it, and they're advancing, but slower than anybody wants. We're going to have to end here. Okay. Thank you so much.